I would rumble snap up to a chicken. That sounds exactly like something I would do. <laughs> it does. <laughs> yes, it is. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Book Retorts. I'm Danielle. I'm Sam. And this is the podcast where one of us explains a weird piece of media to the other person who has no experience with it. At least none that we're telling. Ooh. And that <laughs> yes, we secretly have seen all of the same things and read all of the same books. <laughs> oh, man, that would be a terrible, terrible idea. And also, I don't want to read all the stuff you read, Danielle. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't want to read and watch all the stuff that you do either. That's fair. And this is why we have this show. <laughs> this is why we're perfect friends. The yin to my yang, the, I don't know, the, the plus to my minus, the <laughs> electron just... to my positron. <laughs> there you go. Um, and actually, this, speaking of... The, the choice that I made for today, Sam, I'm actually surprised that you haven't seen, because this seems like something that you would have made me watch in high school. Is this a bold choice, Danielle? You made a really strong choice for today's episode? It's not a strong choice. It falls definitely into my scope of things, but it just, it's, it's so odd that it seems like something you would have watched as well. Uh, that, that describes a lot of things, Danielle. There are only so many hours in a day, Danielle, and I can't <laughs> spend all of them watching the weird media that I crave, which is, again, why we have each other. <laughs> and probably the cornerstone of our friendship. Probably. And you're probably wondering at this point, what is it? I Listeners, have a good idea based on what you texted Danielle? me yesterday. <laughs> yes. Well, I wanted to make sure you hadn't seen this in the interim of talking about it. Hey, that's a good now. point. It's fair. It's what we do. You got you to be careful. <laughs> yeah. If it had fallen into another category, I would have assumed you hadn't seen it. But because this is such an, an interesting film, okay. which is this film, I feel like there should be a drum roll. <laughs> this All is right. A let 19... me do the drum roll this time. You did it for <laughs> okay. me. Excellent work. Round of applause for Sam, everybody. This is the 1990 film, Joe vs. the Volcano. Ooh, I love Tom Hanks. Ooh, ah. Who doesn't love Tom Hanks? Well, That's true. Some people, I guess. It's the it's a classic rom com with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, one of those pairings. Oh my gosh. One of the era of the Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan power couple movie. Yeah, there are all three of them or however many there were. Enough, Danielle. Enough for Enough. it to be a thing. Yeah, exactly. So um, I'm not going to send you, I know we usually do summaries, I'm not going to send you one this time, Sam, because every summary told way too much about the plot of this movie. I am aghast. I know. I think this is one of those ones that's more fun not to know things. Okay. You get to them. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to take an educated guess here, Danielle. <laughs> uh-huh. Go ahead. There's a man named Joe. Yo, yeah. One for one. There's a volcano. Yes, eventually. And he's going to fight it in a boxing match just like Rocky. Yes. Oh my gosh, why are you even bother doing this movie? You are spot on as Look, usual. You may not know the many years I spent as a screenwriter on the sly. <laughs> All those Alan Smithy movies? Who do you think Alan Smithy is? You're welcome, world. <laughs> You're not many things, but you are a screenwriter. Uh <laughs> <laughs> That's what they tell me. All right. Let's get into this, everybody. This Dive classic right 90s in. film. I actually have a, a history with this film in that I watched it in college, sure. kind of hated it. Yep. Uh, <laughs> really, I didn't have the best best feeling about this film after it was done for whatever reason, and I have avoided it for a very long time and f remembered it being very odd and very weird and finally rewatched it for this podcast. I have good news, Sam. It's a good movie? It's a decent movie. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that it's not like the best of the that family of movies, but you know, how bad can it be with charming people in the lead? Right. Well, I thought that going into it in college and yet here we are. Maybe you're just going through your pretentious college phase of like, oh, yeah, this is so <laughs> mainstream and so banal. But it's not mainstream or banal. I mean, maybe that's why I didn't like it in college. Maybe I would see opposite of that. Well, I'm glad you have had your come to Joe moment. <laughs> come to Joe moment. Okay, so this movie opens up with a line of cars in a parking lot. There's just probably a like hundred cars in this parking lot. Is this going to be like that movie, like, was it called Mega Volcano or whatever it was, where there's a giant volcano in, like, California that eats cars? No. Oh. Cars have nothing to do with volcanoes, Sam. And yet we're starting with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
They're, everybody's exiting their cars. It's a parking lot to a giant manufacturing warehouse area. And everything's very gray and dark. And the song 16 Tons is playing. 16 Tons of what? Uh, sold My Soul to the company store. Got it. You, you know the song. I do. <laughs> <laughs> And they're all in there. It's this movie kind of has this vibe of uh, one of those ones that you can't quite tell what time period it's supposed to be set in. All the cars are a little 60s-esque and people are wearing their their hats and their trench coats. But uh, later on, some of the, the clothes are more 90s. I would love to see like a time traveler in their 90s neon windbreakers <laughs> go back to the 60s and try to blend in. <laughs> Well, luckily that doesn't happen in this movie. Why is that luckily? That'd be awesome, Danielle. <laughs> I'm sure there is a movie where that happens. There's got to be some 90s time travel movie where they end up back in the 60s or 50s. Listeners, if this exists, tell me about it. I will do it for this podcast. <laughs> So we follow Tom Hanks. Introduction of Tom Hanks, our character, our main character. His name is Joe Banks. Joseph oh, Banks. so he's the titular Joe. Go figure. Yeah, shocking. <laughs> And he's exiting his car and he's filing into line to get into the building with all the other people and everybody's kind of just drudging in. They're clearly not super happy to be there, as the song tells you. Mm -hmm. And the only sign of color is a small daisy and it's trampled on by all the feet as they walk through the parking lot. Well, wow, how so very bleak. I know. And the camera pans across the sign stating that this building is the American Panoscope, a surgical tool company. Well, those are important. I don't see why everyone's so depressed about making life-saving medical devices. Well, apparently they're known for their rectal probes, so you know. Yeah, you and colon cancer is a killer, Danielle. <laughs> it is. And so the building, think, it's gray. I'm thankful. I can, <laughs> in my modern day, go and get a colonoscopy to help make sure that my colon is healthy. So, yes. excuse me if this movie thinks that's unglamorous, but it's I'm important. Pro colonoscopies as well. <laughs> Everyone listening out there right now, don't forget to get your colonoscopies. That's true. This is They're your important. annual reminder from Book Retorts to get your <laughs> probe on. We do support colonoscopies on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, we support all life-saving and important preventative medical procedures. <laughs> I don't think but that specifically clear. colonoscopies. Well, we have to have a cause, Danielle. Every <laughs> podcast do. needs a cause they champion, and I'm okay with it being the colonoscopy for us. <laughs> Me too. So Great. anyway, <laughs> I'm glad we established that this has I'm nothing just saying, to do with the rest of the plot. This movie seems to be very down on important medical procedures, and I don't approve. I Mostly can see where you can like this movie in college. Nothing to do with medical procedures, and more to do with the surgical tools that go into medical procedures. I don't see how they're different. It has one of those signs in the building too that says "So many satisfied customers," like seven hundred forty-two thousand nine hundred eighty-four, or whatever, yeah. and then and then it flips over to another satisfied customer when they walk in. It was kind of Save Saving lives. They're all lives saved, Danielle. But they don't seem very pleased about having saved all these lives. We need, this is why we have to realign American culture to care about these important yet mundane things. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, Sam's on it, everybody. Don't worry. All right. Well, I don't know. Hashtag colonoscopy life. <laughs> this is why Sam's not in charge of our oh, hashtags, oh. everybody. <laughs> Hashtag BR colonoscopy. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, moving on, uh, moving on. I can come up with a better one. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, okay, I can't. But I expect you, Danielle, to come up with a great colonoscopy book retort hashtag. Okay, on it. Colonoscopy retorts? There we go. Colonoscopy retorts. Oh, those are terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so this building, it's gray, it's dark, it has fluorescent lighting that sucks your soul out. Sure, It has those typical. low ceilings. Uh, and Hank, Tom Hanks enters and goes to sit at his desk. He passes this mousy-looking brunette who is played by... Oh, who do you oh, think oh, it oh, is? Oh, 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 Elvira. Yes. How did you know? Because <laughs> she's ding, amazing. Ding. Is she ever in a movie with Tom Hanks? That'd be cool. I, I doubt it. But, you know, listeners, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, if you happen to know the answer to that, let us know. Um, it's, it's Meg <laughs> Ryan, isn't it? It's Meg Ryan, yes. All right. Well, less exciting, but... <laughs> Still good. So he passes by Ryan, who uses her inhaler, and she's typing at a small table. So she's a brunette in this one? She's a brunette in this one. Ooh, shaking up the formula. Yeah, so she's just like, so it's a mousy little uh, inhaler using brunette. And uh, she's she going to have a makeover where her glasses come off and her hair goes down, and everyone's like, ooh. 
No, this movie's not going anywhere where you think it's going, Sam. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that, actually. Yeah. So the lights flicker and Joe Banks looks particularly ill. Nothing's going right. The coat rack where he tries to put his hat on keeps falling apart. The creamer's bad and for his coffee, etc., etc. And his boss uh, is in the, the same room that he's walking through. And his boss is played by Dan Hedaya. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but... It's the father from Clueless, the movie. Oh. Yeah. And he's doing what he basically did in Clueless as the lawyer father, is that he's arguing very loudly into a phone. And <laughs> you, got, you, have, you have a thing. <laughs> he does. He just has that vibe. Look, he's like, everything if you do he's something in. well, never do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> so he uh, Joe Banks goes to his desk it's a room adjacent to the room that everybody else is in and he turns on this rotating it's this Hawaiian Polynesian lamp that plays music and it has like a print of mountains volcanoes Polynesian themes and it rotates and he clearly is living for this lamp like it's everything to him <laughs> and, <laughs> and he lifts his foot up he's trying to fix his shoe and the Meg Ryan character comes in and she is her name's Dee 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 yeah Oof. And she asks him what's going on with the shoe. And he's like, well, I'm losing my soul. <laughs> All right. A little on the nose funny. there, movie. <laughs> this movie's a little on the nose. That's it's a pun that so vibe. bad. I'm not even sure I would make it. <laughs> so she tells him that he's supposed to send uh, each place on this list that she hands him five copies of the product catalog. So he's like, oh, no can do. Only have 12 copies of this catalog. And so he... She walks off and gets her boss and he comes in immediately and asks him how he's only down to 12 catalogs. He's like, well, I, you, you're the one who orders the catalogs. And I told you three weeks ago and then I told you two weeks ago and we now we have 12 catalogs left. And his boss is like, well, did you tell me last week and blames it on him? I hate that nonsense. <laughs> I know. His boss is terrible. I mean, that's the, kind of the whole point. Right. Yeah, yeah. Put it on thick. <laughs> I appreciate that. Making that character completely unlikable. Good start. He just kind of runs him down into the ground and then joe says towards the end of the conversation that he has a doctor's appointment that day because he isn't feeling well and his boss laments that he has a doctor's appointment all the time and that nobody feels good he goes after childhood it's a fact of life <laughs> he's not wrong i know <laughs> I mean, the fact that they're making colonoscopy devices is a proof <laughs> that it's really downhill for them when you're born <laughs> this movie is very like existential in that way of of life giving meaning the meaning of life <laughs> this feels like a less bizarre terry gilliam film it kind of has that vibe yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely does okay Got yeah it. Mm -hmm. you've you've intrigued me danielle <laughs> it's, it's like a low-key version of that especially as we get into it the boss complains about the lamp he's like i want you to get rid of that and he makes him turn it off and take it off his desk as he's watching what's his him. rationale for that i don't know i think he's just really pissed off at joe banks <laughs> okay well terrible boss got it and he, the next scene, he's going to see his doctor. His doctor's name's uh, Dr. Ellison. And he's played by Robert Stack of Unsolved Mysteries fame. Wow. We just got everybody in this movie. Oh my gosh, you don't even know. It just keeps going. <laughs> So he asks him when he started feeling sick, and Joe explains that he used to work for the fire department, and he started feeling uh, ill after, like, right towards the end of that as he was leaving the fire department, uh, which was about eight years ago. Smoke inhalation is a killer. Yes. So his doctor had run a bunch of labs, and they were meeting up to kind of go over the results of that. And Joe's convinced that he has something wrong with his blood or his urine or he has cancer, like he's going to die any minute now. And the doctor says... No, all your labs were perfectly fine, but you do have a brain cloud. That's not a medical condition. Well, apparently it is. Because I mean, it's <laughs> let, me, let me rephrase. It's not a physical, I mean, it could be a mental medical condition or you know, chemical imbalance, but it's not like something you diagnose them with brain cloud. No, Sam, there's a black fog of tissue running right down the center of his brain, and it's very rare. It's asymptomatic, it's incurable, and he has six months to live. So he's going to prescribe him a tropical vacation. Sort of. We'll get there. <laughs> so he says all his symptoms that he's having are hypochondriacal. They're not real symptoms. They're not related Wait, to this word again? brain cloud. Hyperchondriacal. <laughs> hypochondriacal. <laughs> Is that a word? You're trying to say like uh, he's a hypochondriac, this. right? He's a hypochondriac. I was thinking psychosomatic, but what do I know? Okay, that would work too. All his symptoms are psychosomatic. Let's say Hyper it's hypochondriacal. Hypochondriacal a word. <laughs> I don't know, Danielle. It's fun to say. I know. I'm going with it. And if it's not, we should uh, enter it into the dictionary. I support that movement. Webster, I know you're a huge <laughs> fan. 
of our podcast. Uh, you listen every day, and this is actually Webster himself. So you heard it here first. <laughs> Hypochondriacal. 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 I'm sorry. I can't even get it right. Oh, gosh. Look at me. This is why we need the dictionary to make this word formal so I know how to pronounce it. It's okay. I said it wrong the first time. I said the possibly incorrect word wrong the first time. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time we've made up words, Danielle, and I think it won't be the last. <laughs> so he thinks that his symptoms are brought on by PTSD from his time at the fire department. So I got to understand this 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 whole setup properly. Yes. The doctor says he has a physical condition called brain clotting, which is this black tissue that is dividing his brain hemisphere in half or whatever. And it's spreading. And it's spreading like a tumor. Mm -hmm. It's incurable. He has six months to live and it was brought on by PTSD. PTSD because it's like a mental manifestation of his misery. It's not brought on by any of that. They would have even noticed that it existed, except that they ran all these tests because he Joe Banks insisted. So it, it is no symptoms, but it is deadly. Yes, correct. And the, this is the, the worst the, man of disease I've ever heard of in my life. <laughs> well, that's what he, that's what he has, Sam. So you have okay. to go with it, or the rest of this is not going to make sense. Well, I'll go with. It. I'm just saying. <laughs> come on. <laughs> And so he basically all the stress and living his life on the edge and almost dying multiple times has just made him a hypochondriac. And so he doesn't actually have any symptoms, but he will pass away. Basically, his brain will fail and then the rest of his body quickly follows after that. But it'll be Well, painful. I'd imagine without a brain, the body doesn't work too well. <laughs> no, it does not. So Joe's shocked, of course. He obviously kind of always thought something was wrong, but I guess he didn't actually expect something to be wrong. <laughs> so the doctor's like, good news. All your labs are fine. Also, you're dying. Yes, that's basically how that conversation goes. Worst out. doctor. And so Joe asks the doctor, he's like, well, what am I supposed to do? And the doctor basically tells him, you know, you have six month, good months left to live. Go live your life. Go do what you've always wanted to do. Travel. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> Kick that bucket list. So he heads back to work, Joe does. And he stops in the parking lot to lift up the trampled daisy from earlier. And he kind of like pets it and makes it sit upright again. And I'm sure that's, that's metaphorical for something. <laughs> And once in the building, he starts to go back to his desk. And obviously, he quickly realizes that he doesn't want to be there. Duh. And so he, he ends up quitting on the spot. And he has gets into this argument with his boss, basically saying that he can't believe that he spent so much of his life, that he sold his life for $300 a week to living out of fear that, you know, he couldn't go live his life outside of work. Like, he didn't want to quit because he was afraid to quit. And he can't believe he did that for so many years. Well, welcome to capitalism, buddy. <laughs> He tells his boss that he wants to kill him. Like he gets into his like physical altercation with him. He tells him he wants to kill him, but the worst he can do is just leave him at his job. So that's what he's going to do instead. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're going to spend those six months in a jail waiting trial for assault there. <laughs> no, that doesn't happen. So he Go leaves figure. He leaves the lamp to Dee Dee. He gives it to her, puts it on her desk, and basically tells her that he's ignored his attraction to her this entire time, and he's not going to do that any longer. Does she want to go to dinner that night? And Dee Dee's super impressed by his change of heart and enthusiasm, and she agrees to go out with him. Okay. I mean, yes, yes. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> this is classic, like, oh, I'm about to die. Time to go you know, live life for the fullest stuff. Yes. So far, so good. So they go to dinner and he's a completely different person. He's like full of passion and he's wild and excited about stuff. And he states that he used to be so full of life back before, like when he started working at the fire station and all of that. And he just over time just became afraid to, of dying, afraid of living. He just got kind of stuck in that existential dread situation. And she asks him how he's feeling, which is this kind of unrunning theme throughout the movie where people keep asking him how he's doing. And he's always like, oh, I'm sick. I'm not feeling well kind of thing. <laughs> and she asks him how he's feeling. And he realizes that he's feeling well. He's not feeling sick anymore. He doesn't have any of the symptoms that he had from earlier. So he's curing his brain fog with happiness. Well, no, it's completely separate. Remember, the symptoms are not related to the brain cloud, Sam. No, what's... Uh, okay, I guess I really don't <laughs> understand this brain cloud. <laughs> It's an asymptomatic, painless thing that's going to kill him in six months. His symptoms are unrelated. Okay, so he's just depressed and has a brain cloud. Yeah, he's yeah, he's a hypochondriac. He's with depression and he has a brain cloud. They're completely unrelated. They would not have even known about the brain cloud if they hadn't run the tests. I thought this guy'd be depressed too. That sounds terrible. Well, he's not. He's not depressed now that he's dying because he's like, oh, I have six months to live my life. I'm going to go do it because there's no repercussions, basically. That's okay. Sure. <laughs> so she's not the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> 
Aww. But she's very excited about his excitement. She's just kind of feeling it. And they end up going back to Joe's house. Ooh. I know. So they start making out. And she's like, what's going on with you? Why are you so different? And he finally admits that he's dying in six months. And she obviously can't handle that. And she promptly ends up yeah. leaving. Duh. <laughs> That's a yeah. lot, brother. You can't just like dump that on a first date. Well, he does. I guess it's better than sleeping with her first and then telling her later. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I mean, I'm all about honesty, be not tricking people into bed or withholding information. So he did the right thing. But also, what do he expect like this? He asks her out. He's like, I'll ask her out and then tell her first date that I'm dying. This is going to go well. Like maybe take her out a couple of nights. Don't don't you even try to sleep with her the first night and then maybe break the news gently. Well, nope. That's not what happened, Sam. All right. Well, if I was his hitch style dating coach, <laughs> but uh, let's not talk about that movie. <laughs> And so, anyway, the next morning, Joe is strumming his ukulele that he has, and he's eating breakfast. Of and he's he inter- does. I know. And he's interrupted by his doorbell buzzing. And he lives in this tiny little apartment, super rundown. And he peers through the blinds, and outside is this man that's in this, an older gentleman who's in a bowler cap, and he has a duck head cane that he, like, bangs on the window. He raps on the window. Okay, so he's a secret agent. Got it. <laughs> yes. And it's Lloyd Bridges. Ooh. I know. So it's got the cast. And he's playing a character named Samuel Grainamore. Grainamore. Subtle. Yeah. He asks if he's Joe Banks. Joe confirms it's him and lets him into the apartment. Well, he's got so much to live, so really nothing's a threat to him. <laughs> yeah, so so this, this older gentleman, he looks around the apartment and he's like, not a nice place you have here. And then he promptly slams his gate into the wall and breaks apart some of the plaster. <laughs> okay, he's just being rude. That's unnecessary. I know, Joe's like, what are you doing? <laughs> And the the man seems to know quite a lot about him. So he knows that he used to work for the fire department, that he's shown a lot of courage in that job. He rescued some children, like he took two children out and then went back into the fire to get the third child out. So he's a considered he's a hero. A, he's a hero. Yeah. And he knows that he just quit his job the day before. So he knows a lot about this man, real time information. Okay. And he asks Joe if he knows anything about superconductors. Oh, sure. <laughs> I don't know anything about superconductors. <laughs> what do you want to know? They conduct super. <laughs> right. They, they're, they're superconductors. They're super, they conduct superly. I, yes, yeah, there's my new word, superly. Superly. And so uh, Granamore admits that he knows absolutely nothing about superconductors, but he does happen to own a production company of superconductors that is the premier superconductor factory in the world. So this man who knows nothing about superconductors owns a superconductor factory and is going to talk to another man who also knows nothing about superconductors for some reason. Well, he's kind of explaining it coming up here. <laughs> Basically <laughs> dominates the market in superconductors. And Dr. Ellison has told told him about the news that this that he's going to die in six months. And oh, that's they, a HIPAA violation. Okay, so I looked this up because we've had this conversation before, Sam, about when did HIPAA start? Yeah. It's 1996, so this movie was made in 1990. Still ethically questionable. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you need HIPAA to realize that. Like, didn't doctor-patient confidentiality exist before HIPAA still? It did. It just wasn't like an official thing. Oh, oh boy. Wow. I would. Is everyone in this movie just terrible? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, the doctor apparently told him and they he thought that they could help each other out, which he's going to explain here shortly. So Greenamore says, I want to hire you, Joe Banks. I want to hire you to jump into a volcano. Okay. So he's like, I need someone who's dying to have something to lose, but we willing to jump into a volcano for me. Yes. Is this supposed to be like an experiment to test the superconductor if he'll survive the jump? Uh, no. But nice guess. Solid right. guesswork, Sam. Because <laughs> the superconductors conduct heat very well, too. So I'm guessing, like, oh, we can wrap him in the superconductor, which will conduct the heat away from him and make nope. him, like, a fireproof... Su- All right. Well, well I- it was a nice attempt at trying to make this more rational than it is. <laughs> I tried. So here's the explanation. There is an island in the South Pacific called Wa Pony Woo, mm. which means little island with a big volcano. Okay. And the volcano is called the Big Woo. <laughs> I mean, it's not redundant if... <laughs> I think it's cute. <laughs> okay. So, according to the people of the island, the volcano fire god will sink the island unless every hundred years he's appeased. And uh, they appease him by throwing somebody into the volcano. Well, a man must jump willingly into the volcano. What if they're just superconductors? <laughs> <laughs> 
So let me get there. And nobody on the island wants to jump into the volcano, which Duh. seems unlike, well, okay, yes, in real life, nobody wants to jump into a volcano. But think about all of the cultures in the world that have human sacrifice, and it's an honor to be the human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Like, they had a 100 years to plan this, and you're telling me that this culture doesn't have some kind of thing where it's like, it's a huge honor to jump into the volcano. Is this culture to piece isolated the fire or has it modernized? It's isolated. Oh, okay. Give or mm. take. Yeah, you got a point there, Danielle. I feel like they would have solved this problem on their own. However, they did not. <laughs> Great. And so how does this isolated tribe tie into this weird duck cane wielding, bowler hat wearing, superconductor magnate? <laughs> so it's been 99 years, 9 months, and 11 days, and they need a person to jump into the volcano. What does this have to do with Granamore, you ask? <laughs> I, I literally just, I just asked just that, and asked. I totally forgot his name. <laughs> Apparently, the island is the only place that has more than a gram of a mineral called buburu. All right, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd love this. <laughs> and this is the mineral that powers his superconductors. Why did he pick a mineral that doesn't exist anywhere else? Who knows? <laughs> I'm not saying you, you can necessarily pick the material that makes the best superconductor, but Buburu, this is this is terrible. That's as bad as unobtainium. <laughs> it is. Also, what were they making the superconductors out of previously? Yeah, why don't you just use that stuff? Also, also, if nobody jumps to the volcano and everything's fine, then that doesn't change the fact that he still has access to the Buburu. Okay, so... <laughs> The, what I'm is, saying that. What's happening is the he tried to get the mineral rights from the the island people and they wouldn't give it to him. So he's making a trade for the mineral rights. If okay. he can find somebody to jump into the volcano, they'll give him the mineral rights. So this isolated room. tribe of human sacrifice people has a concept of mineral rights. Uh, apparently. <laughs> One of them speaks English, so, you He's know. Like, oh, yes, I understand your modern <laughs> laws and contract law, even though our tribe is supposedly isolated. I'm sure no. they explain to them, like, we'll take, we need this mineral that's on your island. Yeah, I got that. But it just seems like they're not really isolated if they're negotiating mineral right contracts. They're fairly isolated. <laughs> I'm not going to say they're 100% isolated. I don't know. You don't see them for very long, Sam. A spoiler. <laughs> also, is, is Grey no more British? <sighs> I don't, I don't know. Is Lloyd Bridge? <laughs> this is not. <laughs> Did he have an accent in the movie, Danielle? I don't recall, Sam. I'm going to be honest. Because my point is white people and the natural resources that native people live on haven't always had the best relationship and they haven't always sought actual rights. Like, I would expect him to be like, oh, those are mine now, regardless of what the tribe actually says. I, mean, I don't disagree. However, apparently he's trying to do the right thing. <laughs> well, all right. Well, first time in history. So he's trying to talk him into dying, Sam. He's like, this is the best way to die for the next so the, 20... You didn't mention that. I'm guessing you're going to say that the only way they'll sign him the mineral rights if, is if he finds a willing sacrifice. Right. That's, I just said that. You did? All right. Well, I missed it because I was too <laughs> distracted by all the nonsense around he, he contract law. <laughs> he promised to find them a willing sacrifice if, he would, if they would give him the mineral rights. Okay. All right. Now at home, this movie, airtight now. Perfect sense. <laughs> so for the next 20 days, he's he tells Joe Banks, he's like, okay, for the next 20 days, you can use all my credit cards. You can buy whatever you want. Do it like basically do whatever you want. You're going to fly out to LA on first class and then you're going to take a yacht into the South Pacific and you're going to be treated like a king once you arrive at the island and then you'll jump into the volcano. So you get to you a shorter lifespan. You're going to die anyway, but you get to live the best 20 days of your whole life. Uh, it's a tempting offer. I, I understand that. Right. And Joe thinks about it for like 10 seconds. Is like, yep, that sounds great. Let's do it. <laughs> I want to like be brave and I want to live a good short amount of time on Earth. I want to help some, I'm guessing, millionaire magnate get richer. Basically. <laughs> so, but and appease the fire god. So, you know, he saves an entire tribe. I guess that's nice. <laughs> if you believe in that sort of thing. Right. So the next day is a montage. He he rents a limousine. He goes out and buys all these fancy clothes. He buys luggage. He, you know, makes new friends. He goes to this fancy hotel overnight and he just kind of, he's clearly lonely when he gets to the fancy hotel at the end of the night once everybody's kind of left him you know well that's a problem that can be solved right not that kind of lonely sam oh uh, well you <laughs> yeah. know he was rejected by meg ryan earlier it's true and so after the fancy hotel he arrives in la he takes his first class flight to la and he's met by a woman named angelica houston and got it no <laughs> this is the daughter of graynamore oh uh -huh. guess who she's played by sam <laughs> Angelica Houston. No. Oh, okay. Well, that was it. 
<laughs> it is played by Meg Ryan. <laughs> Oh, Meg Ryan pulling Eddie Murphy in this one, huh? Yep. This time she's like the sexy, breathy redhead whose accent vacillates between like posh and valley girl, depending on the scene. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Is she having a lot of fun with it? She's just chewing scenery. <laughs> Those are the best when the actors just kind of like let loose. <laughs> So she tells, she's basically like, I'm a blabbermouth. My dad wanted me to let you know. Don't tell me anything. I don't know what you're up to. And he told me that to tell you not to tell me a single word of it because I will tell everybody in the whole world. <laughs> and that'll be a problem somehow? I guess so. And they go to okay. a fancy dinner and they're chatting. The Is emotion- Gray no more pimping out his daughter? No, not exactly. Oh, Okay. <laughs> She has the emotional, little of the reasons I didn't like this movie back in college, but my vague recollection of it, is that the emotional backstories on these, particularly the female characters in this, in this movie, they, nobody makes any sense. They're okay. like where they're going from minute to minute in their emotional scope. <laughs> they're very kind of shallowly drawn characters. Yeah. And it's just like one minute they're fine and the next minute they're mad and I'm like confused as to why they're mad kind of situation. And oh. I dislike that about characters, but but this is such an odd comedic movie that I, on upon rewatching, I guess I don't care as much. Well, because you're like, you just have to go with the nonsense. Like, okay, they're, they're just doing whatever it takes to serve the comedic moment. Yes, exactly. And it bothered me less during this viewing. <laughs> well, you've matured, Danielle. I have. Yeah, I've, I've learned to accept things as they are. <laughs> or maybe you're more nihilistic and you're like, Joe gets it. <laughs> yes, that's that's this movie's slightly nihilistic too. So she tells him she's an artist and a poet, and she points to one of the paintings that's in the uh, restaurant that they're in, and it's a pop art scene of a car at a, like a lookout point overlooking LA. And he's like, "Oh wow, that's your painting. It's in a restaurant. That's fancy." And she tells him it's inspired from real life. And the next scene is them at that same point overlooking the Ooh. overlooking LA. And as they're watching the city, she gets kind of morose as she's, you know, as they're just sitting there watching everything and saying, she's like, I'm a grown woman and I'm living off of my father's money. And that restaurant is my father's. And that's why my art is in it. It's not even like it's in a, you know, a restaurant that's not owned by him. (laughs) She hasn't attained anything on her own. It's all been given to her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And she's like, have you ever thought about killing yourself? And she's she's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why would you do that? Like, you have everything to live for. If you have a choice between killing yourself and doing something you're scared of doing, why would you not take the leap and like go do something you're scared of doing? Yep. And she's kind of shocked by his idea. She's like, you mean stop taking money and leave LA? (laughs) Uh, to be fair, Joe is doing both, which is doing something he's scared of, which is killing himself. I know. So, I mean, there's a lot of, I don't want to say heavy handed because it works in this movie, but it, there is a lot of like obvious references to kind of where Joe's frame of mind is. And he's like, see, you know what you're scared of. So just go do it. You know, go live your life. You're scared of leaving LA and not living off your dad's money. So, you know, go, go do that and see what happens. Yeah, Danielle. <laughs> I know you're scared of being eaten by sharks, but go play in sharks covered in chum. See what happens. I'm not afraid of sharks. I'm afraid of whales, Sam. <laughs> okay. My point is, sometimes fear is good. Like, oh, you're afraid of jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. Just go do it. Right. But I think in this instance, like, it's, I don't think it'd be that big of a deal if she left her I know. father. I'm, I'm and oddly lived just her saying that, like, <laughs> As a blanket statement. Yes, it's a simplification of a larger concept. Yeah. And she starts to cry, and then she gets angry, and she's like, we should just stop talking. And he tells her, he's like, look, I don't know you, but we only have so much time on this earth, and we need to use it well. And I'm not any more ready than you are, basically, but, you know, here we are. (laughs) And she doesn't know what to say to that, and he ends up just dropping her off at the hotel, and they agree to meet for breakfast the next morning. She's taking him to the, the yacht. Okay. So the next morning, they meet up. She asks him what he's doing for her father. And he he's like, mm, it's complicated. And she's like, fine, don't tell me. But I bet Patricia knows. And he's like, who's Patricia? <laughs> that was going to be my exact question, Danielle. <laughs> You're Joe. Oh, boy. I don't know if I want to be Joe. My brain fog. Yeah, your brain cloud. Whatever. Taking over your brain. Six months to live. So apparently Patricia is her half-sister, and that's the person that's manning the yacht, the captain of the yacht. Is it another Meg Ryan? I'm not going to tell you that. You're going to have to find out here in just (laughs) a minute. (laughs) 
like about to happen, you could just say yes. Yes. Yes, it's another Meg Ryan. <laughs> I figured, all right. Meg Ryan for days. <laughs> it is. And this time, it's Meg Ryan. It's like Meg Ryan at her Meg Ryanist, the blonde hair yep. in the, the white clothes, classic Meg Ryan. Perfect. It's the most Meg Ryan of the Meg Ryan. It's the Uber <laughs> Meg Ryan. Yes, it's all the Meg the Ryan. Was it, was it Nietzsche who wrote about the Uber Meg Ryan? I think yes, so. Yes, I believe so, in one of his lesser known works. <laughs> yes, God is dead, but the Uber Meg Ryan is real. <laughs> I don't know, know anything about Nietzsche. That's all I got. <laughs> That's good, though. Solid reverence. Thank you. <laughs> so apparently this Meg Ryan is like the salty, wisecracking beauty who gives him a bad time about his clothes and that he's going on this adventure and just gives him a really hard time on at the port. So we have Dee Dee the Mousy Meg Ryan. We have the name I already forgot. Angelica. Angelica. Right. Angelica, the kind of ditzy and morose Meg Ryan. The redheaded vixen. Sure. But I'm talking about the personalities. Yes. And uh, you also have now the wise kraken, salt of the earth. I guess salt of the ocean. <laughs> Salty sea dog, Meg Ryan. Yeah, give or take. All right. So we got our three Meg Ryans. Trifecta. Are there any more Meg Ryan, I don't know what to tell you, archetypes in this movie? You'll find out oh, later boy. on Booker Turrets. <laughs> so much, I really want someone, because I don't want to do it, but somebody <laughs> should do like a breakdown of the archetypical Meg Ryans that are embodied in this film. I have found, having watched uh, many a Meg Ryan in the last 24 hours, <laughs> that <laughs> she's very, her the way her intonation and how she speaks something maybe because i grew up with her voice it's i can't unhear meg ryan like no matter what role she's playing or how she's playing it it just sounds like meg ryan being meg ryan for me well okay fair enough i just want to hear how all the various meg ryans have influenced media throughout history kind of like commedia dell'arte or shakespeare and how we still use those archetypes today for all our movies there probably is a rom-com thesis out there that talks about meg ryan's impact on the rom-com world well, I want this specifically to be the Meg Ryan archetypes from this movie. Well, okay. You uh, listeners, you are welcome <laughs> to send us this. <laughs> I have very specific demands, Danielle, and I need them met. <laughs> Every episode, Sam has the most specific thesis that he wants to hear about. <laughs> I'm a curious person, but I'm very specifically curious. <laughs> Feel free to send that to us at Book Retorts, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> or Book You will receive nothing but my admiration. We will probably shout you out on the show, though, because that's amazing. You, that would you be, go, yeah. listeners. You, you do you. You do amazing work. So, anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. I got to talk about the Meg Ryans. <laughs> Angelica sees them off, and they sail away off into the sunset. Do they play... Uh... And yeah, while they do that? No, but the music in this is actually quite good. Like, okay. I didn't go over all the different Enya's scenes. Enya's pretty good, Danielle. Are you dissing Enya? No, I'm not. I think Enya would have been a great choice for okay. them sailing <laughs> off into the ocean, but I don't think they played Enya. I don't recall any Enya. Maybe Sticks. Either no, way. They did a lot of, um, like, 60s pop music in this. And then, of course, the revamped version of 16 Tons at the beginning. It wasn't the sure. original or the one that we yeah. all know and love. Yes. It's okay. I forgive it. At dinner that night, they're on the yacht. Patricia asks him why they're traveling to Waponiwu, and he's surprised that she doesn't know, like that she agreed to do this trip without knowing anything. And she basically is like, listen, I don't know anything about Waponiwu, except that there are these, like where it's located, obviously, because I'm taking you there, and that there are these people that live on the island that have no sense of direction, and they have a weird love of orange soda. <laughs> what are they? Kel from Keenan and Kel? <laughs> I, didn't, I don't know. They just really like orange soda, Sam, and we will get into that later. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. he, he pull, she pulls out this book, kind of reads a little history from it, and basically what happened is that 1,800 years ago, a ship got blown off course. It had a bunch of people on the ship, obviously, from different cultures. They ended up on Waponiwu, which was Wait, a why Polynesian... Why obviously all from different cultures on the ship? Mm, no, I didn't mean obviously all different cultures. There are obviously a bunch of people on the ship is what I meant. Oh, okay. And they happen like, to all be from different cultures, which I'll get into in a second. 
<laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I'm like, is this something I missed that I should know about? No, I don't know why there were this many different cultures on the ship. Maybe there's just a lot of different ship hands from different places. I don't, yeah, I don't know how fine. ships I, I, I don't question it. I just wonder, like, if it was obvious, I'm like, did I miss something you said earlier about, like, no, multiculturalism it, in this? No, but I have a, I have a comment on this later, uh, which I don't want to explain now because it gives some stuff away, but I'm like, I'll get into it later. Okay. <laughs> so a ship, like I said, gets blown off course. It's a Polynesian island that they get stuck on, but it's very lightly populated. So it's this mix of Celtic, Hebrew, Latin, and Polynesian influences on this island. Wow, that's quite a diverse influence set. It is. And later, when you see the people that live on this island, maybe it'll make more sense. Danielle, I'm only going to see them through your eyes. <laughs> I know. So the conversation's nice. Like, she's not being nearly as salty as she was earlier. And he asks her why she was so snotty on the dock, essentially. And she says that she it's it wasn't necessarily personal. It's because he works for her father, and she's angry with her father for never being around. Oh. I know. Poor girl. Mm-hmm. Well, this Meg Ryan has daddy issues. I think they all have daddy issues, to be honest. Well, I guess that might be one of the unified aspects of the Meg Ryan. <laughs> The gestalt entity of Meg Ryan. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> so he asks why she's working for him then. Like, what are you doing working for your dad if you don't like him? And she says it's he's she's not. She's basically doing this as a favor, and she gets the boat if she takes him to the island. And really? she wants the boat. And she seems a little embarrassed by that admission. So that night, she checks on him in his room and apologizes for being rude on the dock. And as she's about to leave, she ends up turning around and she's like, did you sleep with my sister? <laughs> it's a Oof. wild question when you just met him. <laughs> Wait, he means Angelica, not Dee Dee. Dee Dee's unrelated, as well, far as I, I know. She's still a Meg Ryan, so I yeah, think they're all sisters is. of the, the sisterhood of Meg Ryan. Yes. No, she's talking about Angelica. Right, of course. And he denies it. He's like, no, we didn't sleep together. And she seems reluctant to leave, and she ends up telling him that she's a little freaked out about the trip because she doesn't know anything about it. She doesn't know why they're going or, mm -hmm. you know, much about the island. And she's embarrassed by herself for getting tied in with her dad again when she had done so well ignoring him since she, you know, left home. And she's mad that she got taken in by the ploy and that she want that she wanted the boat enough to deal with her father mm -hmm. she like hates knowing that her price was just a boat you know <laughs> yeah she, she feels bad about selling out her principles for a boat exactly and so the next scene it's morning they're fishing off the boat and patricia keeps catching like fish after fish and everybody's kind of laughing about it that's there's a couple of people that are um like deckhands or helping out sure. with the ship until joe gets a bite and everybody runs forward and is trying to help him reel it in and as he pulls up it's the most animatronic camerahead shark you've ever seen in your entire life <laughs> oh <laughs> it's pretty funny i was like what's it gonna be it's clearly not gonna be a fish and then they pulled it up and i was like well that was a choice <laughs> <laughs> i mean if you kind of robot shock out in the ocean that'd be very impressive yeah they were pretty impressed they threw it back in <laughs> It does its weird googly eyes, you know, they have the eyes on either side of their head. And it does start a finding feature, Danielle, yes. Right, but in the in the animatronic, they're almost like independent of the actual part of the where they're like set in, so they're just kinda like googling. <laughs> it's That's like, great. ah throw it back. <laughs> googly eyes make everything better. Yeah. So that night, Joe's looking out at the stars, and he's just, like, amazed by them. I'm sure the view from a boat in the middle of the ocean is probably quite impressive. And Patricia says that's why she wanted the boat, just because it was an opportunity to get away from mankind, you know, be out in the – get away from people and be yep. by herself. So she's kind of antisocial. Yeah, kind of, in her own way. And he says he can't believe they spent the last years of his life in a windowless room with these horrible people, and he's just amazed by the concept of courage and people who live their life on their own terms. And she agrees that it's like quite the accomplishment, saying that her father always said that most people lived their life asleep, and the ones that were truly awake lived in a constant state of amazement at how incredible the world actually was. Aww. I know. So they start to move closer to each other. And as they're pro like, it looks like maybe they're going to kiss or something's going to happen. And he promptly then decides to tell her about a six months of living and jumping into the volcano. <laughs> uh, of course. So, all right, Daniel, how, we're like, what, half an hour into this movie? 45 minutes? Oh, uh, no, we're like an hour into this movie. Starting an hour in this movie and we're just like still at the, uh, wow. The, okay. vo the volcano is not a large part of this movie. <laughs> I'm very disappointed. So this feels much more introspective than I was expecting from a movie titled Joe vs. the Volcano. We'll get there, Sam. We're so close. So close to the volcano. 
Okay. But this movie ultimately really is about like living life on your own terms and coming right. to it the It just felt like half an hour worth of, of material. I didn't realize you were already an hour in. Yes. It's this movie is under two hours. I think it's like an hour and four. 46 minutes or something in that ballpark. And we're probably an hour into this movie. Okay, well, let's see how Joe comes to his realization about life and living to the fullest. So she's clearly at a loss for words. She has no idea what she's supposed to say to that. And she ends yeah. up going to bed. <laughs> what choice? Like a theme where he like is about to make out with people or is making out with people. And then they, with Meg Ryan's, and then he sends them away. <laughs> Meg Ryan's. <laughs> right. No, obviously that's something you just drop on something like, I got take a moment to process this <laughs> the next day is rough seas he wakes up and it's kind of it doesn't feel the same as it did before and there's a typhoon wa- warning and they're fogged in completely everybody's on edge and the storm starts to pick up and he goes up to patricia and asks her like wait what exactly is a typhoon how does this all work and her responds you know joe i think you're gonna find out isn't a typhoon just a tornado over the water basically yeah, but okay. I like her answer because then immediately there's a giant wave that hits the ship, but there's a non-answer. He's asking you a genuine question. <laughs> no, that's not helpful. People who do that, like, what's the typhoon? Wait and see. Like, that, that doesn't <laughs> help. Like, I don't know what I'm looking for. Maybe I'll you know, – just, just tell me. It's a, it's a better prepared ocean tornado. For, I, yeah, ocean I, tornado. It's two words. I think it'd be better to be prepared for a typhoon mentally than not be yeah. prepared. <laughs> like, should I hold on to something? Should I get below deck? Should I stand on top deck? I don't understand what I'm supposed to do here. Exactly. But no, she just tells Darn them, Darn hey, up Meg Ryans. <laughs> give it 10 minutes. You'll find out. So the wind picks up. The ship's in distress. And they're trying to send out an SOS, but no luck. They're in the middle of nowhere. And the main boom starts to come free. Patricia runs up on the deck and she's trying to, this to get it. This is a sail it. yacht. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. So she's trying to get it all. It's a small yacht. And she's trying to get it all tied back. And Joe follows her concerned about her. Like, you're not supposed to go up there. They told us to stay below deck. (laughs) She's like, it's my ship. And so she runs up there to try and get the boom all tied up. And Joe gets knocked over by a wave. Oh, no. He's still on the ship. It's okay. Oh. And Patricia goes over to him as he collapses. And then they make out for funsies. I don't know why, Sam. What? <laughs> so Meg Ryan's like, oh, we're in the middle of a typhoon. I gotta go. I mean, Connor Meg Ryan, because again, they're all just <laughs> Meg Ryan, apparently. And there are too many to keep track. But Patricia goes above deck in the middle of the typhoon to secure the boom. Mm-hmm. And when the random dude she's ferrying to his islandy death follows her and is laid flat by a wave, she's like, this is the right time for a little make out. <laughs> it's exactly what happens. When they were like, I was like, did I miss something? <laughs> yeah. Uh, typhoon, did guys. Did tie the boom back? <laughs> yeah. Shouldn't you maybe wait until like after the life-threatening situation? Like, I can understand how being in a life or death situation can heighten one's desire for companionship or connecting with other people. But usually that happens after you have come out the other side and avoided the danger or overcome it, not while it is still threatening your life at the moment. Right. And she doesn't even save him. He just falls over. He's on the deck like, oh, I fell over from a giant wave. And she runs up to him and is like, are you okay? And then they make out. And I was like, it'd be one thing if she had saved him dramatically or something. Oh, okay. I <laughs> Meg Ryan. Storytelling was very confusing in that moment. <laughs> yeah. So apparently she did not secure the boom before she went and made out with Tom Cru- Tom Good. Hanks. I was say Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, we got the Gestalt Tom and the Gestalt Meg. <laughs> so the main boom comes free and it like swings over and it hits Patricia and like pushes her out into sea. She, she falls overboard. Never if to she be seen dies again. <laughs> and she's like, uh, if she's dead, I will be. I don't want to say delighted is the wrong word, but I'd be like, this is surprising. I did not expect that from this movie. Way to go. It's fine. It's fine. There's another Megarian on the island. <laughs> oh, so she's actually dead. I'm not going to tell you that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he can't find her. He doesn't see her. You know, the waves are tossing, turning, fog, all that. So he ends up jumping into the water after her, trying to, to rescue smart. her. I know. It's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. So he jumps into the sea after her and can't find her is you know calling her name he he can't see her anywhere he dives underwater and magically he somehow grabs her arm and pulls her above the water line and luckily the ship is still nearby so they start to swim towards her he starts to swim towards it she's unconscious under the water sure but as they're swimming towards it a lightning strike hits it and the ship splits in two sinking into the sea because that's how lightning works Yes, and I guess the crew was dead. Poor crew. We hardly knew ye. <laughs> so a lightning strike hits 
presumably the middle of the ship, and that somehow cleaves it perfectly Absolutely. in twain. Yeah, and it's like Titanic style, uh-huh. like immediate sinking with the things up in the air, and it's just yeah, like yeah, I, I got da-da, it. It's just a, a lightning <laughs> isn't an axe; it doesn't carve. All right, it was it was in this movie. Okay, sure, let's go with it. <laughs> And so Crew's dead, they're alone in the water, and these the luggage trunks that he had bought earlier in the film kind of pop up, and they end up clinging on to them. And the so scene wash fades. up on the island. No. Oh. The scene fades to later after the storm subsided, and this is the highlight of the whole movie, Sam, for me. Oh, okay. Anyway, is the scenes on these trunks. <laughs> So they're adrift at sea. Patricia's unconscious, but it's cool because inside one of the trunks, he has multiple trunks, there is a yeah. bottle of Perrier, what I can only assume is Perrier because it's a green bottle. Yeah, sure. You don't, you don't see the actual like thing, but it's supposed to be water. And he keeps giving it to her in capsules as she's uh, laying there unconscious. Yeah, for vestments will help with the recovery. Absolutely. And there's also a radio. So he pulls it out and starts playing like some 60s jam. So I'm surprised he gets a signal in the middle of the freaking ocean on his <laughs> FM does. radio. Like, it's, it's the only station he gets it's fully clear in it's like a complete song which is great i can't get a good radio signal in my city apartment danielle <laughs> yeah, well, apparently in the middle of the ocean it's fine they couldn't get an sos out but they get a nice signal on the 60s jam <laughs> fair enough so they have some music he pulls out an umbrella he drapes it with a towel and covers up patricia so she's nice and cozy and she so make a raft sun. out of these yeah well there's a raft like he tied the trunks together so i think there's okay. two or four trunks that he's tied together right 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 maybe starts with two then there's four and then joe dances to the music which is the highlight of the highlight of the movie <laughs> it's tom <laughs> hanks dancing to the 60s song <laughs> on a raft with unconscious meg ryan yeah i guess Love life's it. pretty chill if you're gonna die anyways would it matter <laughs> yeah but like what about her well she's protected He's giving care. He's taking care of her more than he's taking care of himself. Okay, fine. So you have this like line of things that he does. He shaves. He finds his shaving kit and shaves because you know it's important when you're stuck on a trunk in the middle of the ocean. Gotta look nice for your Megs. He, he strums his ukulele and he sings a song, a country song. He pulls out his putting green that he bought earlier. He plays around on of golf on top of the <laughs> trunk. <laughs> he's just living life to the fullest out on this raft adrift I mean, in the ocean. It's just great the stuff they come up with their room to do however reality eventually sets in <laughs> oh, darn reality i know and he starts to get sunstroke he starts to weaken he's got the chap lips and skin and and what i actually think was a fairly touching scene he sees this giant moon rise above the ocean line mm-hmm. and he f- he's really shaky he's obviously super weak and he follows it up like he stands up as the moon is rising so he rises with it and he puts his hands in the air and his body looks really small compared to the giant moon you know it's dwarfed and he tears up and he's like dear god whose name i do not know thank you for my life i forgot how big thank you thank you for my life and then he passes out forgot how big what yeah, I think he was going to say how big the world, the moon, he doesn't finish the thought. No, it's just I think like- he's making a reference to the Tom hanks verse, <laughs> which includes the movie Big, obviously, yeah, and all obviously. the other Tom Hanks movies, because they're all in the same universe. Again, we have Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks in a lot of them, so clearly they're all connected in some way. Yes, I'm sure there's some kind of conspiracy theory about how all those tie in together. Yes, absolutely. And apparently they all end with Meg Ryan, because all things end with Meg Ryan. Yeah, she is the Alpha and the Omega. <laughs> So he's out. He finally passed out. And he awakens to Patricia calling his name. Aww. I know. So he sees her face above him and she's like, why didn't you drink any of this water? Why did it? He's like, oh, he tries to push her away. He's like, that's for you. That's for you. And she's like, you need some water too, honey. (laughs) Yeah, duh. I mean, if he had died or whatever, passed out, he couldn't take care of her. I know. It was silly. And he fills her in on what happened with the ship and everything. And you see, as they're talking, you see this the scene shift to a spyglass version. You know, you see like the circle and you see somebody spying on them. And the camera turns towards a person in... Please be a pirate, Meg Ryan. No. <laughs> it's not. It Uh-oh. is one of the native people of the island that okay. they were looking for. And I can't t- I can't decide. Maybe our listeners have a opinion if the garb that they're wearing is offensive or not. Ooh. And so I mentioned earlier that like there's four or five different cultures that are tied in and it's they went to town. Like <laughs> I, it is it's the really the most intense version of like the classic stereotypical native garb you've ever seen. Yeah. They're just like they have flattened orange soda cans as necklaces. 
Okay. Or like parts of their costuming. And then they have a ton of reeds and fe- like every culture you could imagine is represented. So it's somehow offensive to everybody and nobody at the same time. <laughs> that is a true feat. This is like a cargo cult gone wrong. Yeah, it's it's quite – I kept looking at the costuming because I was like, is it, I can't decide because there's so much going on. Like they, they have paint on their, their uh-huh. skin and their clothing and then they have just like everything, grasses, reeds, the soda cans, the like, yeah, that's a headdresses, lot. That's a lot. The, like, just everything. It's like they just went for it. So they're like, okay, we won't be offensive to anybody because we'll be using something from every single culture of known to mankind. <laughs> so here's my question. Who would be qualified to judge whether this is offensive or not? I don't know. <laughs> I just – I could not decide watching it. That's – you know, maybe it's just one of those things where you're like it exists in this weird nether region between offensive and not offensive. Yeah. I, I think maybe it hits that spot, but I, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But there, you see them, the person calls out on the island, they like make a, some kind of guttural call and everybody that's on the island calls back and realizing they've been spotted, they look towards the the island, which I don't think they really realized was there. And all the islanders come out rejoicing and singing to rescue them and pull their trunks ashore. And Do the, the leader, islanders know who they are? They're just like, hey, some randos. No, the leader's like, are you Joe Banks? Because they knew that they were coming. Okay. So they just kind of assumed like, maybe this is him. <laughs> This That's a heck of an assumption. Trunks. <laughs> we and thought you were coming like, by boat, not by trunk raft. <laughs> and like I said, the the person that calls out speaks English, the leader of yeah. the, the, the people. And he goes, he's like, are you Joe Banks? And Joe's like, yeah, that's me. So they can sit and they all like cheer and sing and start dancing. And they have this giant, obviously Polynesian inspired party with a ton of orange soda. Everybody's drinking orange soda and they have lays and they're like throwing flowers on them. And there's drumming and just crazy music. So again, how isolated are they if orange soda is a big part of their culture? I do not know the answer to that, Sam. <laughs> I'm just saying. They seem premise, otherwise isolated. <laughs> I just, it's such a weird like Don't selective isolation where they're isolated enough to maintain human sacrifice and this mythos, but also like orange soda, anybody? I know. And there was really no reason for the orange soda. I thought maybe it would come into play later. Like maybe they'd try to barter with something for it. Or, or maybe it's like magma. Yeah. Like something something would come into play with it. And instead, it just seems like some weird quirk that the writers were like, this will be funny. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a choice. It was. So he meets with the leader who confirms that he's come to stop what he calls the big woo. And Joe's like, yep, that's what I'm here for. Everything's very like blase, the way that they interact. Uh-huh. And he's like, okay, well, this night, tonight we're going to have a big feast. And at the end of the feast, you're going to jump into the volcano, okay? And Joe's like, okay, sounds good. <laughs> that was fast. He gets the whole conversation. He literally says, you're going to have a feast, you'll jump into the volcano, okay? And Joe goes, Okay. So in what I can only assume is an homage to the makeover scene in Wizard of Oz, they do this this makeover scene with Joe and Patricia where they, they're washing them and they're crimping their hair and making them all pretty for the party that night. And they're sure. singing this like song <laughs> in harmony. It's quite, I don't know. There's so much singing when they get to this island. <laughs> I guess they love music on this island. And so that evening at the feast, they're retelling They're retelling the volcano story. Like you can tell that's what's happening in the background. They have all these like puppetry and stuff, you know, acting going on. And the volcano story is retold by Nathan Lane. Nathan Lane is for a no native reason, on is this like, island. <laughs> like for 30 seconds of the film. Yes. <laughs> I love Nathan Lane, but... I don't know why he's in this no. movie. <laughs> yeah. And they barely... Like, the, the scene with him, they don't focus on it like you think maybe they would if they were you know, showing off, hey, we got Nathan Lane to do a few minutes of this movie. He's just yeah. in the background for like 10 seconds, obviously doing the volcano story that it fades back to the guy, the tribal leader, and them talking. <laughs> I was like, that's Nathan Lane? <laughs> I guess it was just a little Easter egg for us. Yeah, it's quite odd. How famous was Nathan Lane in 1990? He was pretty famous by then. Pretty right? famous, yeah. Yeah. Maybe he was on set. He was around he was... like, hey, Nathan Lane, we know you're like a big more guy. Want to just come read 30 seconds of script for us? Exposition? I, mean, like, I sure. really think that might have happened, just the way that he was inserted into this. I mean, he... to be honest, if I was making a film, I had an opportunity to bring Nathan Lane, I'd be like, yes. Exactly. And I, he does have a name in this. It's like Bois or something, but I, they don't they ever say it. <laughs> you I want to say it, it again? <laughs> 
It's like Bois or something. It's like Bois. No, it is. It's like Isn't B-W-A that what or, uh, Christopher or, Nolan does? I don't know. <laughs> yes. It was the precursor to that, Sam. Okay. I could be wrong. I don't remember quite his name, but it was a three-letter, like, short right. name. Anyway, but he's not mentioned that. I just remember that when I was looking up who was all in this movie. Still, Nathan Lane. Awesome. <laughs> I know. Uh, Joe appears. He's in a tux that he picked out earlier in the montage scene. He wanted to look his best for the jumping into the volcano, I guess. <laughs> As you'd expect. Yeah. So he appears like on top of the hill. Everybody cheers. And the chief says, basically, everybody in my in my village is a chicken and didn't want to jump into the volcano. So I'm going to ask them again for a hero. But if none step forward, you're our guy. <laughs> Just like, yep. <laughs> Why would anyone step over when they have somebody who's willing to do it? I don't know. It? And he does it again. He's like, does anybody want to be the hero that jumps into the volcano, you know, in his his lang- native language? And nobody steps forward. Everybody, like, you know, bows down and doesn't make eye contact. And the volcano shakes angrily. And Joe, Why doesn't the chief do it if he's so gung-ho? Apparently, there's some kind of, like, because he mentions at some point, and they don't get much into this, but just something about because he is xyz he can't be the person that is the hero for how, how convenient <laughs> so something i don't quite understand the, the concept there but it's something about his souls tied in with the people or something and so he can't be the one that jumps into the volcano mm-hmm. sounds like you know not really a leader so much just a guy in charge <laughs> i want to i when that happened when he said that i was like well, that's convenient <laughs> so yeah, i had exactly. the exact same reaction to you so I was up in the volcano, but okay, I would do it myself, but my hands are tied and I can't. <laughs> Just darn, oh, I can't. I really wanted to, too. Yeah, I know. I, I was like, oh, I want to jump in the volcano. Really, then I heard about how I can't do it. I was like, darn, I'm gonna curse have to my leadership else. skills. Some random stranger. Yep. <laughs> So the volcano starts to shake and Joe yells out to the audience. He's like, take me to the volcano. And they all start singing and they're singing some kind of version of when Johnny comes marching home. Ooh. Like the ants go marching in. (laughs) But it's like nonsense lyrics. (laughs) And I was like, that's a choice. Why isn't that the song? (laughs) Yeah, no. I mean, that song is... is Kind of a dirge. <laughs> <laughs> but they're singing it just like with, I, I maybe it's a made up language or maybe I just was not understanding the words, but it just sounds like a nonsense song. And Patricia rushes behind them. She's in the crowd and she's trying to get his attention to stop him, but he's, you know, set. He's like, I'm going to jump into the volcano. That's what I came here for. That's what I'm doing. I admire his commitment. He is. He's very low key about it. Like he's clearly accepted that this is what he's doing. Quick question. Mm-hmm. Do any of the other Meg Ryan, Dee Dee, Angelica, do they ever come back or are they just sort of, you know, disposed of because we found a new Meg Ryan? They are summarily dismissed. You never Oof. see them ever again. <laughs> That's a harsh way to treat your Meg Ryan. I know, I and that say. was one of the reasons as a college student, I was like, what is this movie? <laughs> <laughs> oh, one Meg Ryan just goes to the other, I guess. Like, oh, no, movie, no. <laughs> I was kind of offended that, like, Dee Dee never came back. Or, yeah. Like, <laughs> it was kind of strange. Anyway, so Patricia is running behind him. They march up to the top of the volcano, and Joe asks the, the leader, he's like, is there any kind of ceremony? And the guy's like, nope, just jump right in. <laughs> It's funny. They're so blasé about the whole thing. And finally, Patricia breaks free of the crowd, yelling at Joe to stop. And she's like, I love you. And he's like, I'm dying unless, unless <laughs> this whole thing was a sham cooked up by the doctor and Granomore to find a sacrifice. Uh, no, All that's right, not well. what happens in the scene. <laughs> I know, but I'm just like, maybe, I'm trying to think of how the movie would get itself yeah, like, out of having Joe kill himself. Oh, yeah. Well, you're going to be surprised because, uh, spoiler, Joe may jump into the volcano. <laughs> no, I figured he would because it's that kind of movie. It's just surreal and weird enough for that to happen. I'm like, but I'm like, if the movie is trying to pull off the classic happy ending. Yes, we'll see what happens. So she stops him. She's like, Joe, I love you. I've never loved anybody. And I love you. And I don't know why I love you. It's Those like three very... days on the yacht <laughs> yeah, really like... convinced me. Like, No. But you can't jump in. And Joe stops. He kind of looks at her like, you love me? And he explains to her, he's like, I have to do this because I'm going to die either way. And this is the chance to die with courage, you know, for something I want to do. And I'm going to take terms. it on my terms. I'm going to yeah. do it. And like, by the way, I love you too, but I, and I've never loved anybody and it's wonderful and great, but the timing stinks and I've got to jump in. Also, this volcano. Like, like, three days. Uh, no. <laughs> I know. So he's about to jump off the ledge. He like stepped forward again. He's about to jump off the ledge, but she stops him again. She's like, marry me. <laughs> uh... And he's like, 
I don't want to marry you. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, what are you afraid of the commitment? You only have to be married for 30 seconds, which is fair. <laughs> then what's even the point of getting married? Uh. <laughs> and she, he's like, okay, whatever. Sure, let's get married. And so they ask the chief to to walk back up a little ways. And he does a very short ceremony like, do you want to be married to her? Do you want to be married to him? And they're like, yep. Like, great, you're married. All right, I'm going to go. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs> that was certainly worth the time and effort. <laughs> so they kiss. And... He, she's still trying to kind of stop him from walking off the the ledge of the volcano. And he said, he finally kind of like pushes her away. He's like, these are my last words. I got to be brave. I got to jump in. Goodbye. And the volcano shakes dramatically and he steps forward toward the pit of fire and lava beneath. And she steps up behind him and she's like, I'm jumping in too. She hugs oh, him. Oh no. Romeo yeah. and Juliet in this thing? Fairly. He tries to push her away and he's like, what? You didn't sign up for this. Go away. You have your own life to live. <laughs> like. Don't yeah. jump in just for me. That's stupid. It is she, stupid. Yeah. She's like, I'm not doing this for you. She, she goes, nobody knows anything. We'll take this leap and we'll see. We'll jump in and we'll see. That's life. I'm sure that's a metaphor. <laughs> I, I don't like this. <laughs> I mean, I think it's fine. It's like, that's like, you're right. These characters don't make any sense. No, they don't make any sense. It's worth, and then you have, you have to like accept it and move on or you yeah, hate yeah, this yeah. movie like I did when I was 20. <laughs> sure. And he says, you know, during our trip, I saw the moon and they were when we were out on the ocean and I realized how I'd wasted my life. And then I met you and it felt like I'd seen you before. <laughs> Which made me laugh. Cause, yeah, he asked. <laughs> yeah, there, there are so many Mick Ryans in his life. <laughs> felt like I'd met you before. And, you know, this is just more than I could have ever imagined. But I, but I have to jump in, and he's, she's like, and I have to jump in too. And they agree that they're hoping for some kind of miracle that maybe they'll somehow survive. But they, agree I really to hope jump. they don't. <laughs> they agree to jump in together. They clasp hands and they jump into the lava below. But then, <laughs> uh, I knew this movie was going to pull some shenanigans <laughs> for no reason whatsoever. The volcano like spits them back out. It just they start to dive in. You can see them like sinking towards the lava, going down, 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 and suddenly it like reverses and they just like fly out of the volcano into the ocean. And they, what? I don't know. See, so, like <laughs> so the magic volcano is like, oh, this doesn't taste very good. <laughs> yeah, like eh, denied. So they, <laughs> this has gone from like whimsical to farcical yeah so they're stuck in the ocean they're like floating in the ocean and they look over at the island the volcano is sinking into the island it's just like destroyed and sinking below the sea there go all the people <laughs> there's a huge body count on this movie <laughs> The yacht crew of the natives on the island? Like, why is the volcano like, this sacrifice isn't good enough. Let me murder everybody on this island. <laughs> I guess it was going to blow whether or not somebody actually jumped in. I don't know, Sam. Maybe it blew right as they were jumping in. Yeah, but it wouldn't then it'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently it didn't. All the gas exploded into the sky and they just ended up in the sea. That's how that works. Okay. So they're stuck in the water. They're excited that they've survived, but they realize also that they're in the middle of nowhere. Well, in we've the ocean. been here before, Danielle. They just got to find some trunks and a putting green and we'll be fine. Oh, well, conveniently, she's like, oh, don't worry. It'll be fine. It'll work itself out. And then the music crescendos and the luggage trunks pop out of the ocean. This movie. <laughs> and it's funny because Joe Banks looks at her and he's like, how did you do that? <laughs> Blind optimism works every time, except in real life. <laughs> and so she's like, see, told you it'd work out. And they go and swim towards it as the volcano sinks behind them. And they're aboard their trunks. And he points out that like, okay, yeah, we're on the trunks, but we're also literally in the middle of ocean. The, the land that was here is gone. We have no boat. What are we? What are, and I'm still going to die. Like I'm supposed to yeah. die in six months. So what does this solve? And he goes, I have the problem. I have this brain cloud. Like I'm going to die. And Patricia's... It's like, did you get a second opinion? He's like, I, no, I never got a second opinion. Uh, do, you know, Dr. Ellison said I had a brain cloud and I and I ran with that. <laughs> uh, that does seem like a good point. Maybe you should always get a second opinion. And she's like, wait, Dr. Ellison? I knew it. I knew they were in cahoots <laughs> with his father. Her father. And Patricia's surprised as she goes, Dr. Ellison's my, my father's doctor. He doesn't work with anybody else. Why did he work with you? He's like, I don't know. And she's like, wait a second. This was a complete setup. There's a brain cloud. Like, I that's said not even that a real thing. 20 minutes ago, it was a setup. <laughs> I didn't want to tell you, Sam. <laughs> 
She's like, that's God. the stupidest phrase I've ever heard. And they couldn't even come up with a better disease for you. You couldn't just say like you have a tumor, like a, <laughs> a, a, a cyst or whatever. Like, no, nope, brain come cloud. Up, brain cloud. <laughs> She's like disgusted by the idea that they came up with something so stupid. So her father was engaged in all these machinations just to murder somebody. Yes. <laughs> Essentially. All right. I'll, I'll have thoughts when we're done, but go on. <laughs> so Joe starts to feel sick again. He's like, oh, no, my throat its closing up, but I don't feel well. I have fever. And Patricia's like, knock it off. You have your whole life ahead of you. Like, you were so excited to be alive just a few minutes ago. And, you know, that's all thats all you wanted was to have more time. And look, you probably do. <laughs> like, chances yeah. are this is all fake. And he kind of comes to his come to Jesus moment. He's like, oh, you're right. Oh my gosh. You know, like I, I do come have to Joe life. moment, please come to Joe moment. Excuse me. Yes. And they kiss and the camera pans towards the moon that's up in the sky and the credits roll. The and end. they die of exposure on the ocean. Probably. <laughs> Why not? There's enough people died. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thoughts, Dan. I have thoughts. Boy, do I have thoughts. Look, I'm sure it's a perfectly fun kind of semi goofy nihilistic movie. And I'm not going to judge it too harshly. But I wish the movie had the conviction of its characters. Uh-huh. In that the movie's all about like, you gotta be brave, you gotta commit, you gotta live life bravely. And this movie chickened out the end. It didn't let them all dive into the volcano and die in the movie there. It had to contrive this huge plot convenience that let them have their happily ever after. Um, I agree. I wish there had been I don't mind that they survived, but I wish it made a little more sense. <laughs> <sighs> I don't mind that they survived. I think it would have been a much more interesting movie if they had both jumped into the volcano and died and then like yep okay everything that happened was just like them having their moment no i agree and that would have been a really interesting mo- movie i'm not sure that 1990 would have done that in a rom-com <laughs> uh, i agree it was it was way too brave for this movie but just kind of really ironic that the entire movie is all about like you gotta be brave you gotta live your life bravely and the movie's like no nah, we're not gonna be brave well i think the concept is that they Technically, they were prepared to die, and they did. Like they died. They were going to die on their own terms, you know. But they gonna... didn't. I mean, the movie. I know, but they tried. It's not like it was for lack the of trying. The characters didn't chicken out. The characters were brave. The movie, the, movie the writing chickened out. chickened out. Yes, that's what I, I'm saying. Like, I, I wish the movie disagree. was as brave as the characters. Yeah. All right. Also, it would be really funny if Meg Ryan and, and Tom Hanks were just sinking through lava. <laughs> I really kind of wish that the Patricia had died in the water and then he had met another one on the island. I was really hoping for that. That would have been amazing. Like, that would have been so surreal if he just like <laughs> bounced from Meg Ryan. Like they just <laughs> like he goes from Dee Dee, and then once he fails there, he goes to Angelica. And once she's like she passes him off to Patricia. Once Patricia does, like oh, there's Meg Ryan. Like the universe is summoning Meg Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, he's like, they're like, Joe, buddy, I'm trying to set you up. You keep failing. Okay, let's try another one. Here's another one. Oh, you failed that one. Okay, we do another Meg Ryan. Like, we're going to make this work one way or another. <laughs> You're destined to be with Meg Ryan. And for the love of God, we're going to put you with a Meg Ryan. <laughs> Stop screwing this up. Stop telling about your impending death and find a Meg Ryan to settle down with. <laughs> yeah, that's really what all of the other movies are about. Every movie is just you, trying Tom to Hanks put Tom Hanks real. with a Meg Ryan. <laughs> All, all, oh my gosh, I got, I got, I got it. All of them are these like parallel universe instances where like, okay, is this Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks combo going to work out? Ooh, okay. Oh, is this Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan? Gonna, oh, okay. Even the ones that aren't about Meg Ryan are like um, where he failed to even find the Meg Ryan in that universe. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> That makes movies really interesting and weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, like, oh, big. Like, he was supposed to run a Meg Ryan, but uh, he, like, turned left instead of right and ran to this other one. Well, restart. Gotta get another try at this for what the Meg the Ryan. the Mr. Thomas Rogers movie? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know, but, but, you know, Fred Rogers was really supposed to marry Meg Ryan, but... Oh, about Mrs. Rogers? <laughs> she, uh, she's wonderful. But my point is, in the movie, they're trying to get that to work out and it just didn't happen it just didn't happen Castaway again <laughs> he was supposed to deliver that package to Meg Ryan but then right. he got lost at sea and, and ended up with Helen Hunt yeah and then he ended up giving the, pack- the other package to Helen Hunt like there was a package <laughs> in his you know, delivery one of them was for Meg Ryan just didn't work out didn't work out he oh. ended up spending a lot of time on, uh, on an island that makes that movie even movie. sadder <laughs> <laughs> you missed your Meg Ryan in this one I like Castaway as a missed opportunity with Meg Ryan that makes it a whole different <laughs> movie <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have every Tom Hanks movie be in my head. Well, if he's not with Meg Ryan, it's about how he missed the opportunity to be with Meg Ryan. All the other stuff happened just alongside of that. It adds another layer of, of depth and sadness. <laughs> 
Oof. Well, that was quite a movie, Danielle. I know. This is why I was so torn on whether or not I should watch this movie again. It was a really big decision for me, Sam. I can see why I struggled because, like I said, I appreciate the movie is quirky and kind of dark. And like you said, it has a kind of Terry Gilliam surreal aspect to it. But it feels almost like it didn't go far enough. Like it, it was surreal, but not surreal enough to fit. Like it, it had, it was, it was only surreal enough to make it feel weird and unnerving, but not so surreal that it like really made you think. Yeah, I agree. I think I, the, I, unnerving is a good word for it. Cause the first time I watched it, I just kind of had like a uh, feeling about it afterwards. Yeah. It's um, like an uncanny valley of, of yeah, kind of. And then the second time, this time when I watched it again, I I appreciated the message more, I think, as an adult. Yeah, or that makes sense. Or an older adult. I mean, you're a college kid. You're already living your life in your yeah, bravest fashion. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think I had quite the impact when I was that young. But watching it this time, I was like, oh, I see what they were doing there. And a lot of the stuff that they did well, I really appreciated it. But yeah, I would agree that like I think it would have had more of an impact if it had just really committed to that surreal quality. And if maybe if they had died at the end, that would have been a more interesting. It would definitely would have been more interesting story at least yeah maybe yeah but i do love how we have discovered the tom hanks averse here yes i think that's really the takeaway from this this week's <laughs> episode everybody <laughs> any thoughts listeners on the tom oh, hanks man, <laughs> if you want to a talk about that thesis i proposed earlier or b want to expand the tom hanks averse and tell us how your favorite Tom Hanks movie fits into the Tom Hanks averse. <laughs> you can definitely send that to me at bookretorts.com. Or you can tweet, Facebook, Instagram us at bookretorts. We would love to hear from you about the Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever we're calling this. Like, it's almost like, was it like 12 monkeys where the future is set and you can't change anything about it? And this is just like them going through their machinations, but it always ends up the same with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> These movies are so dark now. Who knew? Uh, 12 Monkeys is even part of the Tom Hanks universe, but I still think it, it can be fit in there somehow. It's just like a, not a sequel, but a spinoff. A spinoff, yeah. It's like a, a tangentially related to the Tom Hanks universe. Oh, wow. No, movies just I'm got sure weirder, Tom Hanks everybody. and Bruce Willis have been in a movie together. Oh, that should be our tagline, Sam. Movies just got weirder. <laughs> <laughs> We're making them weirder, Danielle. We're not helping the situation. <laughs> All right. Let us know if you know anything about the Tom Hanks universe. <laughs> <laughs> Please, we clearly don't. Uh, until next time, bye. Take care, everybody. I read three Goosebumps this weekend. Oh, is this part of the fun. Scholastic Book Fair Reading Challenge, Danielle? <laughs> yes, that is exactly why I ended up reading Goosebumps. I love the Scholastic Fairs. They were amazing. And they had their charm. It was so cool. That's a word I probably wouldn't use, but... <laughs> <laughs> that was a dork. <laughs> that is a word I would definitely use. <laughs> Don't regret it. <laughs>